A critical flaw has been discovered in Jenkins allowing arbitrary file read and remote code execution. I wanted to learn more about exploit development, so I spent the last few days analyzing the vulnerability and developing an exploit. Since I don't see a Windows exploit available, I took the challenge of developing it by myself. This is the first time I do this for a real CVE, so there are a lot of trial and error during the process. Most tutorials out there will show you the finished product, but don't really show the countless nights of pain and agony in making it work. In this series, I will show you everything I learned from low-level networking to advanced ways of crafting HTTP requests, from Java code analysis to binary-level troubleshooting, and so much more. So why do we even need a part three? Well, every success has its own stories to get to that path. In this case, our script won't be successful without the important changes I made. This is something you shouldn't miss. Aside from those modifications, I will show you other ways of doing things that I discovered throughout the process. Before arriving at the final exploit, I did several changes. So let's discuss the major bits one by one. First modification is the basic auth header. So let's discuss that. In HTTP, basic auth means you pass the username and password in base64 encoded form via the authorization header. Although this is not really secure, there are still a lot of applications or tools that leverage this, such as the Jenkins CLI. In order to have a full arbitrary file read, we need to authenticate first to Jenkins. If not, we will only see the first few lines of the file. Now let's go to our exploit script and add this header. First thing is we need to create proper command line parameters for the username and passwords. Let's quickly yank some of the lines to copy them so we can edit. These credentials shouldn't be required, so let's remove the requirement. Okay, that's nicely done. Let's quickly save the file. For now, just ignore the comments you are seeing. We will do a final cleanup later. Let's look for the variable that stores the hex value of the upload side payload. We are looking for this because this is where we will insert the auth headers. I just remembered it's better also to add admin as the default username since it's common in Jenkins. So let's do that first. Then let's go back to the HTTP upload side variables. Let's add the condition here that will insert the auth header if it detected a username passed to the script. That means the user is trying to use an authenticated arbitrary file read. You might ask the question, why just don't insert that header always? Well, in some or most cases, you won't be able to get a valid Jenkins credential, so flexibility like this should be included in our script. By the way, you may also notice that I always have a Python shell open on my lower left pane. I have that to quickly do some testing verifications or even look up for information without leaving my terminal. I also use this to test some of my code before I put it on the actual script. Let's import the base64 module. And encode the username and password. Let's quickly see the help menu. I think it's better to indicate also here that we have a default username. So let's add that as well. Let's give this a try. We hit an error. It's looking for a byte object, but we are passing a string. The trick here is to convert first the username and password into bytes object. Then we base 64 encode it, then convert it again into string. Not really elegant, but this should work. Let's go back to Wireshark and search for that TCP stream. We see that the auth header is inserted properly now. The message body containing our payload looks correct as well, and the Jenkins server returns 200 OK. Let's do a final check by comparing this to the request from Jenkins CLI. Looks similar to me. If you spot any issue, let me know in the comment below. Next modification I did is allowing the script to read multiple lines. Even though we specify a valid credentials on our exploit, it is not enough to read the entire content of the file. We still need to use a valid Jenkins CLI command to do that. Right now, we are only using help and who am I commands for the exploit. Let's try to use reload job command to do that.
As a quick demo, here's how it looks like if you do the manual exploitation using Jenkins CLI. Removing the credentials won't work. We need to make sure a valid credential and command is used. Let's go to our exploit script and insert the reload job command. Again, just ignore the comments you see. We will do a cleanup and don't worry, I will publish this script somewhere. Similar with what we did for auth header, the idea here is we will use the reload job command when authenticated file read is attempted. Otherwise, we will use the help command. We already discussed in our part two video what is the meaning of each field here. These four bytes is the actual help command in hex format, and the rest are the frame length, opcode, data length, and a new line character to terminate this frame properly. We need to construct the same thing for reload job, so let's do that. I already got a copy of reload job hex value, so I will just paste it in. I used rapid tables to convert it. Link is in the description below. Let's also don't forget to add some comment to describe the purpose of this code. Going back to the hex values, let's add proper separators so they will be the same format with others. Next, we need to specify the data length. Reload job is 10 characters long. Decimal 10 in hex is 0a. You can also use online tools to convert integers to hex, but there is a handy Python function to do that. After that, we need to specify the frame length. We know that this is equal to data length plus 2. So 12 in hex is 0c. This frame is now constructed. Then lastly, we need to change this to 3131. If you notice on our part two video, I didn't mention this new line characters and this another variable which is injected as part of the payload. These are needed since we are using chunk transfer encoding. To understand this, let me explain quickly what chunk transfer encoding is. In HTTP, the sender typically includes the content length, which is the size of the message body in bytes. In cases where the sender can't determine yet the amount of message it will send, chunked encoding can be used. The format for chunked encoding starts with the chunk length plus carriage return line feed. Then next line will be the actual chunk plus carriage return line feed again. This format repeats for the other chunks in the message body. If there are no more chunks to be sent, it should be terminated with a zero plus carriage return line feed and another carriage return line feed at the bottom. Going back to our payload, the chunk length will be this one. Then the chunk will be the actual frame. The chunk length is 17. That's why we have 3137 here in hex. Later, I will show you a shorter way of doing this using some Python magic, so stay tuned. Now let's do a quick verification. Let's go to Wireshark and look at the TCP stream. We can see here that it is working properly as we see all the contents of the license.rtf file. Another improvement I made is about random UUID generation. Currently, we use a static UUID. Although this appeared to be okay on our testings, it would be better to generate this randomly on the fly to make sure there will be no collisions and to reduce chances of getting 500 errors from Jenkins. Jenkins code for handling the upload and download side connections uses the same concept which we can easily replicate in Python. We can use the UUID module. Then we can use this method to generate a 36 character ID, which I believe is what most applications uses. The method returns a UUID object, so we need to convert it into string. Now let's go back to our script and paste that method. We don't really need further testing here as this is a simple change only. The next slightly tricky thing I need to deal with is how to receive the data from Jenkins. First, let me explain the overall socket code for both upload and download. On our part two video, we created separate functions for download and upload codes so that we can use them as separate threads. I didn't show this in any video, but I did create separate threads for them. Based from my testing, the code works better if I invoke the download side first before the upload side. I understand that this may be counterintuitive, but I haven't dig in yet why that's the case. What I know is that the session ID you use for both of them must be the same so Jenkins will be able to connect them with each other. In this section, we will focus more on handling the data returned by Jenkins, which is on the download side of things. After we send the download payload, we will need to handle the initial response from Jenkins, which contains most of the headers. After that, we will go into continuous loop to receive any further data Jenkins want to send us. On my testing, I noticed Jenkins stopped sending data after these seven byte sequence, so this will be our hint to break out of the loop since we will no longer expect any further data. While there is still data to receive, we will just print the as key representation of the data. There is a slight issue with this, but I thought of sharing as well. Running that code produced this error. It cannot convert hex value of BD into UTF-8 representation. 
There are a lot of encoding schemes we can try, but that might make the script complicated and longer. So for simplicity, I thought of just handling any UTF-8 characters and just ignore the ones we cannot decode. The last major modification I did is to use Python prepared requests. On our first video, we encountered issue with HTTP headers not being set properly. So instead of using request module, we use socket module so we will have full control on the HTTP requests. When I'm almost finished with the exploit, I found out that there is an easy way to do this without using raw sockets. It's by leveraging prepared requests from request module. To give you an example on how this works, first we need to prepare the headers using standard Python dictionary, which is same thing on how we do it in any normal Python HTTP request code. Then we will create a request object, which is a slightly different format from usual HTTP requests. We specify the method, target URL, data, and headers. If you notice, I passed a function to the data parameter. This function contains the following code. Using yield in Python is like doing a loop that iterate on each item, but it's more than that. Yield returns a value to the caller, then suspends the operation. Once that value is returned, it resume execution for the next yield item. This is different in loops where the values are pre-computed during initial execution, then return to the caller via one big list. Yield allows generating a series of values over time, which is applicable to chunk payloads. Going back to our code, we then need to create a prepared request and store it in a variable. Now, this is where the magic happens. We can manipulate this prepared request, such as removing HTTP headers before sending it to the server. In this example, we want to remove the authorization header if you don't have a valid credentials. If we don't remove that header, we will encounter permission issues in Jenkins because it will try to authorize you. Then after you do your modifications on the prepared request, that's the time you can send it to the server. Another interesting discovery I encountered during the earlier parts of the development is about different file name links. This was not really an issue, but I thought of sharing as well. This byte object is 25 character long. But if I create another one, but replace forward slash with backslash, see what happens. The length is now reduced to 23 bytes. So I tried to get the packet capture for both and compare them. I didn't see a hex representation for T when using backslash format. At first, I thought it's a missing byte, but it's not really possible as I'm operating on local networks, so meaning packet loss is not really happening. And TCP is reliable and should be able to transmit those missing segments if needed. Trying to look for other explanation, I found out that hex value of 09 represents backslash T. So there is no byte missing, but the two character backslash and T we are seeing are treated as one character. In a nutshell, if we want to use the backslash format, we must escape it with another backslash. I believe that is also the reason why we need to do this on common Unix tools. Thank you for joining me with this three-part video series about my exploit development journey. As you see, I'm still starting, so there are a lot of challenges I faced. This is just the start, and you will be seeing more from me. My goal is to share valuable information that others don't show. If you find value on my content, please like this video and feel free to share to others.